Good morning, everybody. How are you today? Great. We are going to go ahead and get started worshiping. Feel free to stand, sit, uh, whatever you uh, prefer. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bush, you'll know, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bush, you'll know, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bush, you'll know, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saves.
Good morning. Man, I like that. Y'all can have a seat for a second. I don't know about y'all, but I was ready to... I forgot to grab my microphone, so I came through the little green room area, and so I was standing on the stage trying to feel like I was a part of it. I was about to grab a pair of spoons and start going to town. Oh, my goodness, y'all. It is great to... Will you give up for the, for the praise team this morning? Don't they sound great? Oh, I love it, love it, love it. Hey, good morning. My name is Aaron. I'm the lead pastor here, and I am so excited that you're here with us this morning from wherever you are, whether you're here in person, whether you're here online. How's it going? Y'all looking great? What cup of coffee are you drinking? I'm not judging if you got creamer in there, but maybe a little bit. Uh, but anyways, hey, we're so glad that you're here this morning. Uh, we would love everyone, if you have a quick second, to grab a connection card. It's in uh, the seat back in front of you, or you can go grab a digital one at our website, southcreek.church. Would love for you just to fill one out super quickly. Let us know who you are, where you're from, blood type, credit card number, social security, just very basic, non-invasive information. And uh, we just love to know who you are, how we could better serve you. You can also tell us about ways you may need prayer or like to serve. Uh, and if you're newer here today, we'd love for you to, especially if you're here in person, to fill out the connection card and then take it to the uh, desk in the lobby that we call the Connection Center. And uh, we have a free gift for you just for being here today. Uh, I cannot promise you that. Uh, word on the street is it is uh, season tickets to either the uh, uh, IU Hoosiers or the Purdue Boilermakers, whichever one you prefer. That's what I heard. I don't know if that's true. You'll only know if you fill one out and take it there. We'll see. I don't know about y'all. I'm not sure how I'm feeling about uh, Big Ten football this year. It might be a rough rough year for us, but the Lord shall still be uh, good. Yes, even Ohio State people. I saw you shaking your head, Scott. Uh, hey, want to let you guys know about a few things happening in the life of our church. If you got a bulletin as you walked in, this is your moment to grab that out real quick, and uh, I'm just going to run through a few of the things that are happening in the life of our church. One of them I, I am just, I could do backflips about, is we have a baptism Sunday coming up on Sunday, September 19th. That's coming up pretty soon here. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more about baptism, possibly being baptized, uh, you can either fill out one of the connection cards or you can contact me. Uh, my email is just Aaron, all uh, lowercase, A-A-R-O-N, A-A-R-O-N, uh, at southcreek.church. And I would love to let you know more about that. Here at, Bap here at South Creek, we believe baptism is an outward expression of an inward change. That is not something that saves us, but it's something that lets us know others that we, let others know that we have been saved by Jesus. So if you'd like to know more about baptism, we'd love to talk to you about that. You also see uh, we're doing some great stuff here uh, through our community outreach team. Uh, shout out to a bunch of crew uh, Katie got uh, all set up this uh, last Friday. A uh, bunch of people served at Hog in the Block. So thank you so much if you served at Hog in the Block for Bridges Outreach or if you bought. If you ate pulled pork uh, to support children, thank you so much for uh, putting, putting, putting yourself aside and doing that. So. Uh, it's an awesome thing. Uh, but you'll see one of the ways we're still partnering and doing some things is uh, right now you can grab stuff in the lobby, but we're doing a fall food drive in partnership with uh, the Kokomo Rescue Mission. So I think there's boxes and bags that are out there. Grab those. Uh, you can see some of the needs that they have here and uh, fill them up. And don't, don't grab this stuff. Like don't grab like uh, pineapple tuna. Grab something nice, okay? And uh, I don't know if that's a thing, but if it's a thing, I don't want it. Uh, but find something like that, and it's going to be awesome. Uh, lastly, there's, there's a couple other things you'll see going on here, but I want to highlight on Saturday, October 2nd, we are hosting something in partnership with a ministry called Preserve Marriage Ministry. And uh, it is a free event, although we'll uh, gladly take a free will dono donation offering to help uh, kind of cover some of the cost. Uh, but there will not be child care, but it's going to be an awesome, awesome time, whether you been married uh, for uh, a day or a hundred years, uh, this is something that we believe will be really, really important and helpful to you. It's going to be an awesome thing. So if you have little ones, make plans now to get some child care action happening. Uh, beg some grandparents, some nieces and nephews, something like that. It'll be perfect, but we're really looking forward to that. Uh, hey, today I'm excited because y'all later on are going to get to hear from one of my favorite pastors, one of my favorite uh, speakers, Pastor Jerry Osbrook. Jerry was a uh, pastor uh, for 20-some years here, I think, right? Associate pastor? 12 or 15. 20 sounds, we're going to go with 20, okay? 
the man, put him on the Mount Rushmore of South Creek, right? Um, Anyways, but I'm so excited. It's also going to mean that I'm going to get to kind of dip in and out. I'm going to go hang out and see what's going on in South Creek Kids because it always kind of sounds fun. And so that's also uh, going to be something that's going to be fun happening today. But y'all, I don't know about you, but after that first song, I'm ready to worship, aren't you guys? So would you guys stand up and uh, join me in a time of prayer as we just prepare our hearts to just worship uh, more through song. All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. And God, we thank you for the fact that, uh, God, on this holiday weekend, on this Labor Day weekend, God, uh, we can be reminded that we don't have to work for our salvation. We don't have to do things to earn your love. You already love us. God, this morning, I know some of us come in with heavy hearts, with worried minds, with anxious thoughts. Some of us come in with anger in our heart. Some of us just come in distracted. And God, in this time and in this moment, God, I pray that you would help us to focus in, to allow whatever is going on swirling in our mind, good, bad, or indifferent, to just sort of dissipate. That any voices that we hear speaking to us would be hushed. And that right now, all we would see, all we would hear is from your son, Jesus. So Father, we invite the Holy Spirit into this place. And God, we pray that these songs that we sing, that the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing to you and bring you glory and honor. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies And there's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide Where all the love I've ever found Comes like a flood, comes flowing down At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life I'm in all of you, I'm in all of you Where your love ran red and my sin There's a place where sin and shame are powerless. There my heart has peace with God and forgiveness. Where all the love I've ever like a flood comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you where your love ran red and my sin
Heavenly Father, we come to you today just thankful um, for everything you've given us. No matter how big or small the blessing, the blessing may seem to us, we know that it fits into your perfect plan. And at the, the end of the day, it will be to the glory of you. God, we just want to strip away all the distractions today as, as Pastor Jerry comes and speaks. Let us focus on you. Um, you know, if we have to just forget about religion for a second and think about Jesus, the cross, and what you've done for us and what that means. Um, you know, we're thankful for the sunshine and, and everything else, uh, that our health, everything you've given us. Um, be with us as we go about this long weekend and... Um, let us glorify your name. We love you. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Good job, guys. I'm not going to sing the offertory, so we'll just wait till it's over. <laughs> Thankful that's a very important part of the worship service, is giving, uh, returning our tithes and offerings back to support the ministry, the work of the ministry here. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about the work of the ministry, and my, I titled my message, You Are the Work of the Ministry. So many times we expect... Uh, 
even without verbalizing it, uh, the pastors to do the work of the ministry. You know, that's what we pay them for. Well, that's not what we pay them for. You are the work of the ministry, and I'd like to share a little bit about that today. So if you join with me in prayer uh, before I speak. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the great privilege to stand before this uh, wonderful group of people. And I pray that you will encourage every heart here today, that you will speak in, in the way that only the Holy Spirit can to each heart to interpret what is theirs. And Father, I pray for utterance today as I, I feebly try to share this message. And we thank you, Lord, that you are uh, a God that we can approach and worship. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to be jumping around to, to uh, uh, several different scriptures, but uh, I, I want to give a little background on the, the first book that I'll be speaking out of, and it's 1 Corinthians. Paul was speaking to the people in Corinth. He wrote them a letter, uh, 1 Corinthians, and he says to those, uh, he introduced himself, Paul called to be an apostle. And then he began to address them and, and uh, speak to uh, people uh, uh, that loved God everywhere. It wasn't just an isolated message. It was a universal message. But it was also dealing with specific issues in the church. And I find it interesting that, that uh, one of the first things he did is he said, grace to you and peace from God our Father. He said, I always thank God for you because of the grace given to you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way in all your speaking and in all your kindness, uh, and, and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. What, what a great compliment he gave the people of, of the Corinthian church, uh, mostly Gentiles that had been saved. He says, therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God who called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. What a, what a great introduction and, and a welcome and a, a, a gift of significance he gave to the church. And then he follows up, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you. And he goes on to address the divisions among them. They were a great people. They weren't lacking anything. God had given them everything they needed for the ministry, and yet they were missing the purpose of God in their lives because they were allowing themselves to jump in uh, the equation. And then he goes on, and this is the first scripture I want to begin with. No eye has seen what no ear has heard. And what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. The King James Version says, No, uh, eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them. He was dealing with issues in the church, and I want to back up a little bit and continue. Uh, uh, they, he referred to them as a cosmopolitan city. They were multicultural uh, people from all over the world were there. There were all kinds of influences there. And the church, uh, sadly to say, was being influenced a little bit by the cultures of that day, the sinfulness of that day. And the purpose of this letter that he wrote was threefold. One was to identify the problems in that wonderful church that lacked nothing. To offer solutions, it's always important if you're going to point out a, a need to offer a solution uh, or it just causes another problem. And he was there to teach the believers how to live for Christ in a corrupt society. So many times, and I hear it over and over and over again, and I'm not, I'm not trying to act like I'm, I'm dull to the day and age we live in, but everything we're dealing with is not new. To society. It has been over and over and over again, and godless societies have risen up, and God has knocked them down and overcame and, and blessed the people of God that were faithful. I'm thankful that we don't have to live in a doomsday uh, society, 
I'm thankful that our children and our grandchildren don't have to face society with a, a, a fear, but that God has prepared them and brought them into the age and into the generation that he wanted them to for such a time as this. And that's the way the Apostle Paul was. He was a man called of God and he was not only fulfilling his calling, but he was fulfilling his purpose. And there's two major differences there and I will address them as we go on. The Apostle Paul was standing in his calling, but he was also uh, uh, fulfilling his purpose in loving the church and directing them in the uh, direction they should go. The, Corinth, the Christians at Corinth were struggling with the environment. Surrounded by corruption and every conceivable sin, they felt the pressure to adapt. They knew that they were freeing Christ, but what did that mean to them? How should they view idols or sexuality? We're there. What should they do about marriage? The church was being undermined by two things, immorality and spiritually immature teachers. And it was leading them astray and causing divisions among them. Some of them were even arguing as Paul said, well, I'm of Paul, well, I'm of, I'm of this one, I'm of that. And Paul said, I'm glad that I didn't even come to you speaking in, in great words. I came to you speaking in humility and simplicity so that you can't claim it was me or anyone else. He said, it's one, one plants the seed, one waters, but it's God that gives the increase. And so many times we as the church of God forget and, and I'm trying to be positive here, that it is all about God in all of our lives. And I'll address that a little more too. Some of them were failing the test, the test of their faith, and Paul heard of their problems and wrote this letter to confront them with the sin for the need of correction and for a clear commitment to Christ. And then he said that interesting scripture that we just had up there. Eye hath not seen nor ear heard. Neither has entered into the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for those that love him. It, he didn't say for those that are perfect and do everything right. He said God has a plan that none of us have ever dreamed of. And uh, it, it's, uh, heaven is great. But uh, he, I believe he was also talking about the here and now. Because he was addressing the here and now. There are things in our lives that we've never dreamed of. I heard uh, Mark Lowry speak the other day. And he said, you know, uh, Gloria Gaither told me one morning that God is more in our distractions than he is in our plans of life. She had found that out. And so many times we forget that God is a God of everything, every detail in our life. Every suffering, every heartache, every, every uh, affliction, no matter what it is, God can help and wants to help and bring his glory through it if we will stay submitted and surrendered to him. Not perfect. Everyone wants to pull up the red, white flag and say, I give up, I can't. Well, that's why Jesus died for us, because we can't. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit to come call alongside of us because we can't. But in him, we can. I am thankful, and I mean no disrespect to anyone, that it's important and it's good that we have a, a place here that it's okay not to be okay. But I want to tell you this morning, out in society, it's okay to be all right. It's okay to have victory in your life. It's okay to be able to share the glory uh, uh, of God the things that are working within our lives and recovery group well, Chuck and, and I always encourage too don't come and tell a big sad story come and tell what you've found that's working in your life and it will feed and change the lives of everyone around you we don't need to bring a depressing gospel to a depressed world that's lost and dying. We need to bring a gospel that speaks about our life that is in, in tune with God and, and that is nothing that, that we can boast about, but it's something that is wonderful and brings romance, thrills, and adventure into our lives as we walk with him in the dark places. There's a song says that if you walk with him in the sunlight hours, he'll walk with you in the shadows. 
We're all headed for shadows. We all have shadows. Those of us that have married, we've been married 44 years last Friday. We've had shadows in our marriage, believe it or not. We haven't chased each other around the house every day of our lives. <laughs> we've had hard times. We've had hard years. But by God's grace, we've held to the one that brought us together, that can keep us together, and that can wage the storm because he is able that, my friends, is the work of the ministry. That is something that Pastor Aaron and Pastor Megan cannot do for you. They cannot influence those in your circle. They cannot influence those that are, that are at the grocery store that you see every week, those at the gas station, those that you live with. Because there's a purpose of God that's going on in your life <coughs> excuse me, that only you can allow. I've seen precious people fulfill their calling and miss their purpose because they didn't love those at home, because they put their calling before their family, because they didn't realize that their purpose uh, complemented their calling, especially in the distractions of our life. I think you can tell I'm a little stirred up today. There's a dear lady over there, last time I was preaching, she was with me. She's with me today. She has a light on her face. And I told her the next week after I preached last time, I said, boy, you were helping me. I look for people that are in there with me and help. I said, I could have just preached all afternoon. Her husband leaned up and said, I'll remind her of that next time you preach. But God says that he has things prepared for us that we've never even thought about. Prepared means made ready for use. We don't feel ever like we're prepared for use. I don't. I had my wife pray for me on the way to church today. I said, I'm, I'm just a little antsy. You pray for me. But oftentimes, we forget that God is God and he has things prepared and ready for us, including heartaches and troubles, and difficulties. Oftentimes, we lose sight of the fact that God is working when we don't feel it, when we don't see it, or when we're not aware of it. We get lost in the issues of life. I do, and you do too. The issues of life sometimes distract us. They catch our attention. And before we know it, we're caught up in the worldly things or the worldly conversations, and the issues of life begin to rob us of our joy and our victory. The scripture, this scripture is not only in reference to heaven, but it's to having the mind of Christ and trusting him to fulfill his work in us. My concern is that we not become chameleons. In this day and age, it's really easy just to fly under the radar where we're at because this is a day and age to where if you, if you have a standard or if you do stand up for something, you're a hater. Well, I tell you what, let's stand up in humility and love and be called haters. We don't need to be obnoxious. We don't need to be Bible bangers. That's what's got the title hater already. But we do need to stand firm and have an assurance in our heart of what we believe and who we, who we belong to. We need to make sure that our lives are full of humidity, humility and conviction that makes us shine as lights in a dark world. Philippians, that gets us to Philippians. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to his good purpose. And I think there may be a second. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. He's talking about our lives will exemplify that of the cross, that of uh, the Spirit of God, uh, and it will be a witness in itself. Shonda Pierce said, 
for young people, one of the greatest ways to witness is to do what you know is right, make good choices in the eyes of your peers, and then have an answer ready when they question you why you did that. It's simple as that. Be children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firm the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on that day of Christ that I did not run in labor or vain. Paul continually and continually goes beyond his calling and meets his purpose of nurturing and loving the people of God. You say, well, I don't know what to say to witness. Well, I tell you what, if you're sensitive to God, he'll help you know what not to say, and that will shine a lot in the public eye or in the home. Not joining in and the criticism and the, and the, the rhetoric that's going on today. As people start talking all this stuff, I just kind of check out. I don't want to join in because by God's grace, our view should be higher than politics. Our vision should be higher than anyone who likes someone or doesn't like someone or did this or did that. It should be uh, of the kingdom of God knowing that we have a God that uh, is standing in the shadows that still has not relinquished his authority. And we can trust him. We can stand underneath the shadow of his wings with great assurance facing whatever may come knowing that he is working in our lives for such a time as this. God is not mad, and God doesn't hate anyone. God continually wants to work with the lost. No matter who they are or what they've done, he wants to work with them. Sometimes we're put around people that we don't like, or people that don't like us, uh, it's our inconveniences. I can remember when uh, our daughter was four. She's 41 now. We were greatly inconvenienced by a tragic situation that happened. Our neighbor tried to abduct our daughter, our little four-year-old daughter, our little innocent, precious daughter. And to make it worse, I was in the backyard when it happened. And then I got cued in on it. Well, I'm thankful for God's mercy and grace and restraint. People have been killed over situations like that. And God gave me restraint to confront him and tell him that I know what you're trying to do, and I will not allow it. And when we called the police, he was arrested. And God, in his mercy gave us a detective that usually wasn't on. I, I don't know quite what the circumstance was, but he was on call or he covered for someone. But he loved our daughter in the questioning. He sat down with her and ate candy at the table. They unwrapped candy and ate it and visited. And when he got out of her what he needed to hear, he tried to get me. He picked her up and said, I've got something I want to show you. She never knew what all went on. And she got to go out in the police car and work the lights and the siren and all that hoopla in the police garage. And she came home excited. Well, I want you to know God is so faithful. That man has stayed in touch with our daughter up to date. He made dates with her in her teen years, to take her to Coke. He'd talk to us about her. He'd encourage her. He'd go to the restaurant where she worked and encourage her to make good choices. I saw him in the bank the other day, and the first thing he said is, how's that lovely daughter of yours? He was a man that knew what the true work of the ministry was. He was a policeman by calling, but he was a Christian by purpose. And he loved the Lord, his God, with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength, and his neighbor as himself. It could be very easily overlooked to do the purpose of God while you're fulfilling your calling. People were all guilty. 
And that's where my heart, at it, heart is at today. There were so many connections that came out of that, I don't have time to tell you. But they were all good. God worked in a wonderful way. The young man got sent away for a few years, which he should have. But God was glorified from beginning to end through our lives in that because of inconveniences that we had. I'll tell you one other convenience connected to that story. I got a call that night. I worked at the mental health center. I got a call from a therapist and said, Jerry, I need your help. I said, well, what's wrong? He said, well, uh, this young man's been placed, a 17-year-old, this man's uh, been placed in the mental health center until we uh, get some testing done to convict him. I said, well, that's fine. I have no problem with it. He said, I'm not worried about you. I'm worried about all the other staff. They're in arms, and you're going to have to help me with the staff. Well, selfishly, they should have helped me. It was my daughter, but I knew in my heart that God was calling me to set the mood and set the example of loving a sinner that needed help, not con condemnation. Not one that needed hatred, but needed love. And some way, in a miracle, this young man attached himself to me and didn't know who I was, and he loved me more than anyone on the floor. And there came a time where the therapist said, Jerry, you're going to have to set him down and tell him who you are. But I'm thankful that through all of that inconvenience and that suffering that we went through, God was working with every staff on the floor and even that young man's parents who are our next door neighbors to the glory of God. Now, if I'd have climbed the fence and killed him, it would have been a really mess, which any of us men are capable of when you mess with our kids. God wants us to allow him to help us in our distractions because usually God is in our distractions far more than he is in the plans of life. Amen? Have you found it so? God is using us to fulfill his work in others around us. As we love him, he will give us love for others. That gets us to the third scripture in Mark. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no command greater than these. In, in uh, Matthew, Jesus said, all of the prophets, all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So I'm thankful that we don't have to miss God's purpose and all things are fulfilled in Jesus if we're loving God with all of our heart and we're loving our neighbor as ourselves. And that sounds like a nice cliche, doesn't it? But when the rubber hits the road and the inconveniences come to our homes, the suffering comes to our home, the afflictions come to our home, the failures of children or, or spouses comes to our home, it's a whole different ballgame. But God is wanting to be glorified in you through the inconveniences of your life. If I ask you how many of you are dealing with a situation and, and ask you to stand, I don't think there would be anyone seated. We all have difficulties. We all have heartaches. That's part of being in the flesh. But I'm thankful that someday when it's over, by God's grace, we'll hear, by his mercy, well done, thy good and faithful child. Enter into what I've created for you. Oh, I tell you, it will be worth not losing sight over. It will be worth not getting in the last word or the dig. Martin Luther King Jr. said, one of the best ways of loving your neighbor is just not doing them wrong when the opportunity arises. Doesn't mean being best buds, but it means not paying back evil for evil, and that is loving our enemies. And in that alone, we begin to stand out as stars in a dark and crooked, perverted generation. Hurt people hurt people. Our world is full of hurt people. We're hurt. There's, there's issues that we have. I'm not the only one in this room with issues. We all have issues from our childhood, from, from hurts, from disappointments from betrayals of people. But I'm thankful that our Savior sees all of that 
and has something prepared for every one of us in spite of it or because of it. I'm thankful to be married to a precious woman of God. And I've seen her fulfill her calling as a teacher. She felt called to teach as a little girl. But she didn't miss her purpose in the classroom. There were times that she loved and ministered to young women and and young men. And there was a situation. She was teaching downtown uh, at Central. And she built a relationship with a young lady uh, from a fairly prominent family. And uh, she just loved her and encouraged her and, and gave her that gift of significance. And then a few years later at high school, this young girl went full-blown alcoholic in adolescence alcoholism addiction. And it was a, it's a very, very sad thing. Her parents were devastated. There was issues, legal issues. And there came an inconvenience to Wilma's room at Central. Her boss walked in and said, Wilma, I have called a substitute to cover for your class. And I'm sure she was taken back and said, well, what? He said, there's a family at high school that's in crisis. And the parents are requesting that you come there because you were the only adult that their child would listen to. It was a great inconvenience. She had to change her her teaching schedule that day. But she stepped into the purpose of a woman of God and ministered to a family in crisis because she had not just fulfilled her calling a few years ago. She had fulfilled her purpose. One night we were laying in bed in the middle of the night and she got a call from someone that was in her first class that she taught back in Oklahoma. And I think this girl was in her 40s. And she called and she said, my life is a mess. I'm very unhappy. I'm laying in bed by a man that doesn't love me. And I just need to hear from someone that loves me and cares about me. And I remember in the hallway, years before, that you told me you loved me and cared about me. That's not part of the calling to teach. That's part of the purpose of God. And if we're not careful, we can try to separate the two and say, performance doesn't save me. No, it doesn't, but it could very well save someone else years down the road because they see the work of God in your life at a time when they need it. As I said earlier, Pastor Aaron can't do the work of the ministry that you're called to do. He can support you in your heartache. He can support you in the hard times. He can pray for you on your job. He can pray for your marriages. But the work of the ministry comes down to your willingness to do what Jesus said, and it's pretty straight. Except a man deny himself and pick up his cross and follow me daily, he cannot be my disciple. That makes it pretty easy. It's impossible with us, but if we follow him, he makes all things possible and turns everything to our benefit. In the last scripture in Ephesians, it says, it was he who gave some apostles, some prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be teachers and pastors to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And again, the King James Version, I grew up on that, so I quote it. Uh, He places some pastors, uh, evangelists, teachers uh, in our lives for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. You are the work of the ministry. Pastor Aaron and Pastor Megan are here to perfect you for service to guide you, to instruct you, to pray for you. But when the rubber hits the road, they're not driving. God should be driving. They're trying to point you to a God that has so many things for you that you've never even entertained or never even thought are prepared for you and working in the hearts of the other people. 
we never know who's watching our lives. We never know uh, what our kindness does to people. Wilma and I were on a uh, trip, a bus trip to New York City here about five years ago. And we loved it. Well, I, I enjoyed seeing sights and being with a bus full of people. She likes that more than I do, the bus load of people. I'm more introverted, whether you know it or not. I can sit there and let everybody else visit and just stay out of it. She loves to interview every person around. <laughs> so I find out everything about everybody. I just don't have to, to exert myself because it is an exertion. Well, there was a lady that I recognized, and I had never spoken to her before, but I recognized her from working at Howard Community Hospital when I worked there for 10 years when I first came to Kokomo. And so I asked her if she worked there. She said yes, and we got to visiting. And uh, she was an uh, older lady. She is now in her mid-80s. But we visited with her. We tried to encourage her. We just tried to be Jerry and Wilma. And I can remember sitting outside a shop, and she was too worried to go in, and I didn't want to go in and shop, you know, husband. I think God put that in some men because he used it that day. And he used Wilma shopping that day. But we sat out on the benches while Wilma shopped. And I visited with her and we got to know each other. And when Wilma came back, she had bought herself and I a cookie. And she also bought Janet a big cookie to eat on our trip home. And at the end of that bus trip, she came up to me and she says, Jerry, when I die, I want you to do my funeral. I said, well, okay, but you'll have to work out the details. Well, I didn't even know her last name. And when I found out what it was, I couldn't pronounce it. It was a French name. It had a bunch of L's and T's in it, and the L's were silent. And I, I asked how to do it, and then I wrote it out Oki, Oki style, Oklahoma style, the way it sounded, you know. But she called and said, the funeral home called and said, the family of this man are requesting you to do his service. And I said, uh, are you sure that they said Pastor Jerry Osbrook because there's other Pastor Jerry's in this city? I said, yeah. And I said, I've never heard of this individual ever in my life. And I said, well, they said, she asked for you. So I called, and as we shared, I told her, I said, you know, there's nice ways of saying that I don't know your name. I don't remember you. I said, I can't put a face with that name. And she began to review the story of when we met on the trip. She worked there at Howard Community as a secretary. Wilma and I visited with her and encouraged her. Wilma went shopping. I sat and visited with her. And Wilma brought a cookie to her. She said, I remember so much how kind and loving your wife was to me. And Wilma looked at me and went, Because if we consistently walk with God, our purpose will be found for everyone we're around, and it won't be that much of a work. Her purpose was to love and encourage this lady, and she said, I remember I ate that cookie all the way home from New York. She was touched. She wanted me to do her husband's funeral. And then... When she goes, she wants me to do hers. And I always add that in there. Well, don't rush it, you know. Enjoy life. <laughs> but we never know who's watching, under what situations or circumstances. If Wilma and I had been aggravated and tired and arguing out there in that little center in front of her, she never would have wanted to have anything to do with us. But when I said, you know, I don't really want to go in there, she said, okay. She probably turned around and said, yes. <laughs> but you are important to the work of the ministry in Kokomo you're important to the work of the ministry in your schools in your jobs in your homes I had a young, young pastor's son tell me one time with a broken heart he said you know my dad's a great preacher but he's a horrible person it broke my heart. We can be great in our callings and miss our purpose if we're not 
sensitive to what God is calling us to. I trust that this has not been negative to you. I trust that this will be encouraging because you are the work of the ministry and I has not seen nor ear heard neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for you. For those that love him and you love him. We sacrifice and are intentional about building our lives, buying our cars, our careers, our homes. And if we're not careful, all of that can be of nothing if we're not fulfilling our purpose in the midst of it. Most car salesmen, I hope there aren't any here, but I just don't trust them. (laughs) But that does not give me right to be mean to them. We just bought a new car. And we, we loved and encouraged the, the dear lady. She was a student of Wilma's. Her husband was a student of Wilma's. And uh, uh, again, the purpose touched their lives. And it was a pleasant experience. And I walked away not feeling robbed. Most of the time, I'm always wondering. But I want us to be intentional about our relationship with Christ. I want us loving our neighbor. And there are four things, four principles that I try to hold on to that help me stay on track. And I've heard it for years. I heard it uh, before I moved to Indiana 44 years ago. Read, pray, witness, and obey. Those four things will help you stay on track. As we read the Word of God, as we meditate upon it daily, I will tell you, I'll throw this in as part of my purpose to you. If you're not reading the Word of God consistently, you're getting off course. Everyone should have shouted amen. As the people of God and the Word of God was given us, if we're not reading it consistently, I hope that you will. And I hope that was a positive note Patched on that little loving correction. If we're not praying, we're playing. I heard Leonard Ravenhill, a great evangelist, say that. If you're not praying, you're playing. There's a time for playing and a time for fun, but there's a time to pray. And so that we can be sensitive and discern the difference when it's time to play or cut up or be serious, and be soul-minded. Amen? I hope you're with me. Can't fire me. (laughs) We need to be intentional. Read, pray, witness. Step into an opportunity when God gives you the opportunity. Our anniversary is always a great opportunity. How are you all to, oh, we're celebrating our 44th anniversary. Well, how in the world did you make it 44 years? And my mouth was full that day, and Wilma said, do you really want to know? She goes, yes. She said, we love God more than we love each other. We're trying, and we love each other very much, she said. But we try to keep God first in our lives, and he sustains us through the difficult times in life. Pretty simple. We could have made a joke. Oh, well, you know, I just put up with it or she puts up with me and had a high ho time. But we had the opportunity to plant a seed and be faithful to a soul. And you know what she said? She said, you know, I've been thinking about that lately, about the importance of committing and allowing God to help my life. Fulfilling our calling is important, but we need to fulfill our purpose in the midst of our calling. And close with a little story about Simon Peter. And I I love the story where Jesus uh, enters into the boat, teaches the people a little offshore. They had fished all night long and hadn't caught a thing. And yet Jesus turns around and says, cast out into the deep. And, and by the way, throw your nets over on this side. I can imagine they didn't have automatic engines to pull the, the threads in, the nets in. 
They had worked all night long and hadn't caught one thing, he said. And he said, Master, we've worked all night long. I can just see it because I've been there when God's required something of me. And I'm like, oh, you know, I've done that, been down that road. But he says, but at your word, we will do that. And we know the story. They began to catch a lot of fish, so much that their boats began to sink. And then Jesus said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Well, there's something I like about that story. He entered into a boat that had been in the waters all night long. The same waters, fished and fished and fished, didn't catch anything. And then at his word, at his navigation, he led them to the right place at the right time. And we are vessels. Boats are vessels that are designed for navigation. Every one of us here in this room have been designed for navigation through the Holy Spirit that God has given us. And a lot of times we miss it because of the cares of the world, because the inconvenient times throw us off. So I'll pray, as I, as I close in prayer, I'm going to pray that God will help us to be sensitive to the fact that we were designed for navigation and there are people in your life watching you that you never dreamed of. If you're professing Christ, they're watching you. And some are waiting and hoping that you'll not fail them. I was in National Guards. There was a guy from my hometown. I'd never talked to him at National Guards, but we were cleaning our weapons, and somebody let out a big old row of curse words, and he thought it was me. And he laid down his weapon and came over and got in my face and said, Jerry Osbrook, I cannot believe you'd talk like that. I'm so disappointed. And I said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> that was him. That wasn't me. I don't talk like that anymore. And such relief came into his life. He said, oh. He said, I was going to say, I, I, you, it was so disappointing. I, I've been watching you. There are people that are watching you. They're waiting for you to step up and to fulfill the purpose of God in the midst of your calling. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for this group of people. I thank you for the word of God, that it's a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Lord, I pray that your word will light our path, that your truth and your sovereignty will guide our steps, and that you will help us, Lord, to be the work of the ministry in this dark and crooked and perverse generation that we live in. Oh, God, I pray that we'll not join arms with the crooked and the perverse and the dark things of this world, but that you will help us to lovingly stand as people of God in love and humility so that we can do the work of the ministry, so that you can do the work of the ministry in ways we've never dreamed never thought of, or never could bring about in our own strength. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God's got things prepared for you that you've never even thought about. So the next time you're in a difficult situation, don't think about the difficulty. Think about the purpose of God in the midst of your difficulty. You dismiss. Thank you.